So uh, I'm going to talk about um, updates in the diagnosis and management of achalasia. This one. Green button. Thank you. Just my disclosures. So achalasia uh, has been around for a while, and in fact, the first described treatment was uh, in the 1600s when someone figured out that if you took a sea sponge and secured it to the end of a whale rib and crammed it down someone's throat, that this would help uh, with their dysphagia. Um, this is the old, and I'm going to share with you a little bit about the new, and we'll just focus on, on the updates uh, over the last couple of years. Um, so the evaluation and diagnosis of achalasia uh, is sort of time-tested. There are tests like time barium esophagram, upper endoscopy, high-resolution manometry that we've been using to diagnose this condition for a long time. I wanted to share with you updates as it relates to the Chicago classification version 4.0, and then a little bit about endoflip, and I'll try not to be repetitive where Dr. Lador has already covered a few things here. Um, so we'll start with the Chicago classification version 4.0. So what's new as it relates to this topic? Uh, first of all, uh, there's some more rigorous protocols uh, that have been developed incorporating supine and upright positions as well as provocative testing uh, to allow for some standardization of how these tests are uh, conducted. Um, there is conclusive and inconclusive designations that are now available based on associated symptoms, <coughs> excuse me, provocative testing and supportive testing with uh, barium esophagram bolus challenge and or endoflip. And these are the, the high-resolution manometry tracings of the three different types of achalasia. You can see on the left is type 1 achalasia, which is the second most common variant or, or version, which uh, about 25, 33 percent of all cases are type 1. This is uh, impaired EGJ relaxation, uh, no peristalsis, and an inability to pressurize the esophagus to more than 30 millimeters mercury. Uh, type 2 is in the middle. This is the most common, about 50 percent, two-thirds are of this uh, variety. Um, this uh, is similar to type 1, except it involves uh, uh, panesophageal pressurization to more than 30 millimeters mercury. And then the least common is type 3, which is about 5 percent. And this involves uh, luminal obliterating uh, contractions. So EGJ outflow obstruction is a condition that's been defined in version 4.0. Um, so first of all, EGJ outflow obstruction is an abnormal median IRP. So this is integrated relaxation pressure. It's a manometrically defined and calculated metric. Um, and so greater than 20 percent over the elevated intrabolus pressure in the supine position and not meeting criteria for achalasia. That's, that's EGJ outflow obstruction. These are two different examples of that condition. What's, <clears throat> what's been clarified in this version of uh, the Chicago classification is to acknowledge the fact that we know that some patients with EGJ outflow obstruction can evolve towards achalasia. So this may be early achalasia, it may be a variant. <clears throat> but to uh, acknowledge what we also know, which is to say that more than one-third of cases where the uh, manometry software tells you that this is consistent with EGJ outflow obstruction are clinically irrelevant. So it can be related to benign etiologies like mechanical effects, we know that opioids, patients who are on a lot of chronic opioids can have manometries that look exactly like a patient with achalasia. And obviously, we do not want to treat these patients with, mono with myotomy. And so what's been helpful is that, uh, and again, we'll focus on EGJ outflow obstruction because this overlaps with achalasia. Uh, we, what we do now in the new classification system is that for this to be clinically relevant, you have to have symptoms of dysphagia or non-cardiac chest pain. So when this gets spit out of the manometry software in a patient who doesn't have these symptoms, it doesn't matter. Um, and it, a conclusive diagnosis of EGJ alpha obstruction also requires a, a corroboration with at least one supportive test, and so either endoflip or time barium esophagram that shows the same sort of abnormalities. And so that's, that's really good clarification for those of us that see these manometry reports and wonder if we should be treating this patient like they have reflux or like they have achalasia. I'm not going to go into this whole diagram, but this is from the Chicago classification uh, version 4, which sort of shows you the algorithm and a, and a lot of useful sort of decision points here to help guide you through some of the more ambiguous um, findings on previous uh, manometry reports and with the previous version of the Chicago classification. So we've talked about endoflip. I'm not going to re-explain that. Um, 
we talked a little bit about how endoflip can be used to assess uh, motility. I wanted to focus on achalasia first of all. So Dr. Lador mentioned uh, some different patterns of contractions that you can see on endoflip. So repetitive contractions are three or more uh, sequential consecutive contractions. Um, they're typically anagrade in people with normal motility, and it's a secondary peristaltic response to distension. So when you blow up the endoflip balloon, a lot of people will start to have contractions. We see it all the time in the OR. Um, so, but they're usually in the anagrade direction, so from top to bottom. Patients who have repetitive retrograde contractions have abnormal motility. That's not something that we see in people with normal motility. It's often observed in patients with spastic disorders, including achalasia, and it's not seen in normal controls. And so here's just one small study published a few years ago, but illustrates my point. 51 patients with achalasia, 10 normal controls. You can see these different patterns. Uh, normal patients on the left have contractility absorbed 100% of the time. Uh, and the, the right-sided columns, type 1, 2, and 3, you can see for type 3 achalasia, the RRCs are those repetitive retrograde contractions. That's the darker colored gray bar that goes up to 80%. Very commonly observed during endoflip assessment uh, in patients with type 3 achalasia, repetitive retrograde contractions. So it can be helpful in that regard. Endoflip can also be useful in the OR. Uh, it can be useful to guide treatment, and the metrics that we observe have also been shown to correlate with symptomatic outcomes. And so this is looking at the stensibility index, which is a metric calculated from endoflip. It's basically, uh, it's the pressure that's required to distend the luminal structure to a specific diameter. Uh, and so the higher, the, higher the, the stensibility index, the more distensible things are, the lower, the less distensible. Um, and you can see here that patients on time barium esophagram with no retention have higher distensibility indices than patients who have retention. This is post myotomy. This is Dr. Ujiki's study looking how changes in distensibility correlate with achalasia treatment outcomes. This is a longer term follow up study. Basically shows that patients who had deltas in their distensibility index, so, so very low pre treatment, higher post treatment, the bigger the difference, the better the treatment outcome when looking at Heger scores. So some practical tips as it relates to using endoflip uh, in the OR as someone who's been doing this for about seven years for my achalasia patients. Assess the distensibility pre and post myotomy. Sort of the, the delta is very useful, as Dr. Ujiki showed. Um, this is harder to do than it sounds. Patients with dilated esophagi, patients who have retained secretions in food in there, patients who have these sigmoid esophagus or really tight GE junctions, it can be difficult to get the endoflip catheter down. Use the endoscope to guide things. Um, shoot for the, uh, a change in the distensibility index of more than three, a final distensibility index of greater than three if you're unable to um, attain this preoperatively, or uh, if you can't do either of these. So sometimes one of the issues with the endoflip, especially if you really work hard to get the catheter down, is the pressure gets all messed up and you can't calculate a distensibility index, but you can look at the minimum diameter, the cross-sectional area at specific volumes. So I try to get the D-min over 10 millimeters if I can't get a distensibility index. Um, post myotomy at 40 millimeters or 40 milliliters in the balloon. And then avoid blindly passing the catheter from proximal to distal. So when I do these, I place the catheter all the way in the stomach. I'll do my myotomy, I'll pull it back so the waste is at the GE junction, and then I'll push it back in because I'm, I'm assessing it multiple times. It may be to see if I think I've completed the myotomy. It's likely to be after the hiatal repair and fund application just to assess how things look. Um, but don't pull it all the way back and then go forward because you can easily perforate the mucosa, uh, especially post myotomy. Uh, final updates, uh, so POEM, uh, we all know, has been around for a while, and it's emerging as the standard of treatment in type 3 achalasia, and evidence and expert opinion is accumulating such that uh, supports the position that POEM or Heller myotomy uh, are acceptable in patients with type 1 and 2 achalasia. And there's multiple society statements and guidelines that suggest this. Um, GERD outcomes, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, there's a lot of data out there on this. This is one particular trial that's more recent that I just wanted to highlight. New England Journal of Medicine a few years ago, a randomized controlled trial of POEM versus Heller with partial fund application. It was a non-inferiority trial designed to go two years, and you can see here that the equivalent, excuse me, the outcomes as assessed by Eckert score were equivalent for both of these interventions. When looking head to head, POEM was a little quicker. Patients stayed about the same amount of time. More serious adverse events with Heller, but esophagitis was seen much more commonly with POEM than with Heller. <laughs>
And so when Heller, uh, I think any time, especially type one and two, sort of depends on your local expertise, uh, patient preference, uh, and concern for GERD long-term outcome, and insurance obstacles is really sort of what drives this. It, 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 unfortunately, it's still relevant, and it can be difficult, at least in my market, to get some of these patients approved. Uh, hiatal hernia, a significant hiatal hernia, we know that this can affect GERD outcomes, uh, especially without a fundoflication following a poem. Patients with hiatal hernia were excluded from this New England Journal trial that I just referenced. And we also know the association between obesity and GERD. The mean BMI in the New England trial was 24. Um, and so uh, be a little careful about doing a poem in a, a morbidly obese patient. And in fact, um, consideration in my opinion should be given to a gastric bypass in a poem concurrently in those folks. Uh, POEM is the best option, I think, clearly in type 3 achalasia. Uh, it's great as a salvage procedure following incomplete myotomy after either Heller or POEM. In patients with an erroneous diagnosis of GERD undergoing fundoplication without myotomy, uh, so the achalasia patient who gets a Nissen, which we see, I see about once a year, POEM's great for that because they've already got a wrap. Uh, and then post-gastric bypass who develop, uh, patients who develop achalasia years later, which seems odd, but I've seen a couple of those lately. Great poem candidates. These are the guidelines. I'm not going to go in it, but these are your uh, publications for your reference. Multiple societies have guidelines that basically are consistent with what I've shared already. And so in conclusion, uh, Chicago Classification 4 has useful definitions for EGJ outflow obstruction and achalasia variant syndromes. Endoflip is a really useful diagnostic tool, um, both in the OR and uh, in an ambulatory setting. Uh, in conjunction with uh, manometry and other technologies. Uh, POEM is preferred in type three and an attractive option in type one and two. And there's uh, a lot of uh, evidence accumulating and consensus statements and expert opinions that can help in your fight with the insurance companies. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thanks,